So we just had a wonderful presentation by Rick Cotton, uh, a keynote address. Uh, Rick Cotton, the CEO of the New York, New Jersey Port Authority, who gave us the overall landscape of the uh, infrastructure development uh, for the port and uh, in general. We are delighted to have with us uh, Sam Ruda, who are from the uh, Port Authority of uh, New York and New Jersey, and Andrew Gen from the New York Economic Development Corporation. And they are going to make two presentations on New York, New Jersey, local and state freight perspectives. I'd like to thank the Port Authority and also uh, the uh, New York Economic Development Corporation for being with this event every year. Uh, and as I mentioned before, our event aims to promote the image of New York as a global maritime hub to an international uh, and domestic community. So without any further delay, I will uh, ask uh, Sam to please uh, take us through his presentation and then Andrew will follow. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Nick and everyone at the team at uh, Capital Link. Actually, Andrew and I have actually been together on this panel uh, before, so I uh, do welcome and, uh, Andrew and uh, really glad to be participating with him. Uh, I guess I have the uh, distinction of um, following my boss, uh, Rick, Rick Cotton, and I think that's always the better order for the boss to go first. Uh, uh, and I uh, assure you that I won't be uh, re repeating the content that uh, he delivered to. I'll be taking it down in terms of the trends that we're seeing in terms of freight movements, as really we've been living through this COVID scenario for um, eight or so uh, uh, of months. Um, and I, I just also want to just welcome all the participants. I know that there's folks from all around the, the world, uh, including the metropolitan New York area. So thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Um, you know, I, I, th th this, this whole COVID, um, you know, uh, event, uh, which we're now really into the eight or ninth month, and I know collectively we'd all love it to be in our rearview mirror by now, but it really started in, in, in February and it's in it of this year and it's, and it's taken on, you know, different, different shapes as it has evolved. You know, as we started the, uh, the new year and we were all starting to hear about um, COVID uh, outbreak in, in, in China, you know, from a supply chain maritime port perspective, this really started as a uh, really a China factory supply chain shock. Uh, people will recall that, uh, you know, what what typically happens is that you have the uh, the lead up to the Chinese uh, Lunar New Year celebrations, factories closed for two weeks. That's all expected. Of course, in this particular case, what didn't happen was that the factories did not reopen. And that obviously started what looked to be, at that time, just a supply chain shock. As we, as, as things evolved, you know, there were a couple, you know, I would say dominoes that quickly uh, followed. Uh, by February, uh, at least for the North America uh, market, all cruise activity came to a, a, a halt. Uh, that includes the, uh, the cruise activity uh, that the Port Authority oversees, as well as my counterparts at New York City uh, EDCs. That quickly uh, evolved into a European uh, factory supply chain shock as the COVID situation really started to break out Italy and, and, and other areas. And then in, the, in this time frame, we, we then had really a, it was now impacting the whole demand situation uh, as the US economy uh, really came to an abrupt uh, close. You know, you heard from Rick Cotton that uh, the, the port has been, uh, the port division of the Port Authority, i.e. The, the maritime division, has been really resilient. And I'll actually show you the, the, the volume trends. Uh, we, we are, in, in, in fact, um, you know, we, we, we saw volume uh, uh, drops, but by August of, of, of this year, and, and even into from July, we started seeing a, a rebound in uh, volume. And uh, August, we set an all-time record. September will be very strong, and now we're into October, and volumes continue to be uh, very, very, very strong. So 
um, supply chain shock to demand shock uh, to recovery. That, that's kind of an interesting set of uh, trends as, as COVID has played out. We could talk a few, a little bit more about that, and I'm sure it'll come up in the, in the uh, Q&A. This is just a, a, a year-to-date breakout of that trend that I just started, that I talked about. You know, January, and this is just the container volume at the port, which is our largest component of our, our franchise here. About 75% of our business is, in fact, container uh, related. You know, January and February were almost untouched uh, by, by COVID, largely because of, you know, we're 30 days out from, from, from China. So um, uh, really, things really started to take shape in terms of the drop as we looked into uh, March and April. But even there, it wasn't a precip precipitous drop. I'll show you how the carriers have responded with, with, with blank sailings. And when we look at these TEU numbers, I mean, this is imports, this is exports, and this is empties. But even at the, in the height of the COVID situation, you know, our import volume never really fell below about uh, seven seven percent year 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 over year, um, which is you know telling us something very much about the resilience of, of the economy. Um, and in fact, the container trade during a, you know, a really problematic set of, set of events. You know, automobiles, uh, uh, which is another strong segment of our, our, our business, definitely saw some uh, decreases. You know, we're probably down about 25% in automobiles year to date. But I, I would note it's also starting to recover, frankly, very quickly. You know, auto at the, at the front end, of the, at least the first half of the COVID situation, I mean, basically you couldn't go buy a car unless you did it through the, the internet because automobile dealerships were not deemed uh, essential uh, businesses. Um, they are now back open. You can go into, in, into showrooms. Obviously, we're gonna start getting the benefit of the 2021 model year, uh, new, new, new cars. So, Again, despite all of this, and we have seen declines in autos, as I just mentioned, um, we're still going to do over 300,000 plus uh, uh, finished automobiles uh, this year. And, and I would actually note that our export volume uh, has increased, and it's increased uh, on the uh, electric uh, vehicles, Tesla and, and, and others. So what's really kind of interesting about um, the shipping industry, and uh, I will full disclosure uh, before my uh, career in the in the port sector, I spent 17 years in the container shipping uh, industry. I did everything from 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 pricing to uh, lo logistics, um, and you know I, I I want more than anything else for the steamship lines to be successful. I want them to be profitable. I want them to be invested. And I, and I would say that the shipping industry, I think, has gotten much better at, uh, you know, basically flexing uh, capacity uh, in response to demand changes. And you see this chart here, the, the, red, the red charts go, going down, the red bars going down, uh, is basically the number of sailings that got canceled as the demand shock really, uh, and supply, sh supply shock and demand shock kicked in. You know, the height of our blank sailings was in the month of June. And this, this blank sailing, you know, chart in, in, in a red actually tracks very well with the volume trends that I just uh, in indicated. The blue bars actually on the, on the top side are, are new services that were added. In some cases, uh, shipping lines added the port of New York and New Jersey to uh, the coastal rotations that we previously weren't, weren't, weren't on. What, what this shows is obviously the, the, the height of the, the demand um, and, and supply shock was in the you know, June, July timeframe and the number of blank sailings has really, uh, of course, lessened as, as depicted in the chart. I, I would say that uh, just an interesting comment in the, in the March and April timeframe you know, all the blank sailings uh, were out of Asia. Today, even though we are showing blank uh, sailings, none of them are from the Asia Pacific uh, region. 
combination of Central and South America and um, some of the Atlantic and, 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 and Med. Uh, so in one, in one respect, gee, we, we lost services, uh, but I think it was a very effective carrier response to the realities of, of, of COVID. I'll make a final couple of comments on that. And this is my you know, last, last slide before I turn it over to, to Andrew. You know, these are just some, some observations in terms of you know, what we see happening from a local freight perspective. I, I think some of these observations transcend the local view. They may be national trends. They may, in fact, be global trends. But you know, I, would, I would say that COVID is definitely accelerating trends that were already in place. And that was the, sh the shift to brick and mortar retail to, to, to e-commerce. Um, and that's actually playing very much into, you know, the strength of the container uh, uh, business. Um, unfortunately, COVID is also forcing huge tectonic changes, perhaps in the negative direction. And, you know, for the cruise business, which was not a big part of our franchise, you know, that business has gone to zero, likely will remain at zero for the remainder of this calendar year. Probably we're looking at April, May of next year for resumption of, of, of services, perhaps sooner, uh, but that's kind of what it looks like today. I would note that while, you know, we've been, everyone's been focused on, on COVID, you know, tariff friction between the China and the U.S. remain. But I think it's definitely has, has quieted down. Um, you know, we have seen slippage in the amount of cargo coming from, from China. But that is a trend that was in place before uh, COVID uh, and, and, the, and the tariffs. Um, you know, my final comment or my final two comments here is that uh, I don't think this is an original phrase, but this idea of the stay at home economy because of COVID is really playing into the container business. People are still buying, they're buying things uh, for their home. Uh, at the commodity level, what are the things that are up? Furniture, appliances, home goods. Uh, Port of New York and New Jersey is a big importer of um, wines, beers, and, and other spirits. That is way up. So uh, people apparently are drinking more at, at home. And, and buying a lot of furniture and, and appliances. And this whole e-commerce and shift from retail, I'm sure Andrew will be talking about that has some you know, big implications for big urban centers in terms of trucks and delivery and, and, and last mile. My final observation is, is that uh, as, the, as the shipping industry, as cargo demand has really recovered and recovered strong, you know, the ocean carriers, uh, you know, uh, which is a good thing, have increased uh, ocean rates, in some cases significantly. We're seeing some small uh, but notable modal shifts from uh, container to bulk, especially in terms of import uh, lumber. So, uh, you know, I, I would say that uh, we, we remain, uh, you know, optimistic uh, about the future, maybe Maybe the, the current state is keeping us up at, at, at night, but uh, that's just a, a quick overview of some of the trends that we see happening. I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thank you, Sam. Uh, now I'll put up uh, some slides as well. Say, it's a pleasure to be here as always, uh, and really thanks to Nicholas, and Annie and Eleni for uh, hosting us uh, again. Um, I always know that uh, fall is here and the leaves are going to change when uh, I get the email from Annie saying it's, it's time for Capital Link. So uh, it's, it's always welcome. So uh, I wanted to pick up on uh, some of the themes uh, and we sort of introduce like EDC and um, uh, the uh, Agenda, our, our maritime agenda and you know the economic development corporation works very closely with the port authority of new york and new jersey um, i don't think we've ever worked uh, better together um, uh, it's uh, it's a wonderful collaboration and it's very interesting i think um, in that 
sometimes uh, like at the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal uh, that EDC operates, uh, we are the tenant of the Port Authority. Uh, and then in other cases like at uh, the Helen Hook Marine Terminal or Global Container Terminal on Staten Island, the Port Authority is our tenant. So uh, it's, uh, we have uh, kind of an amazing relationship and uh, we truly get along. And uh, the goal is, um, you know, really how do we uh, best utilize uh, this infrastructure? Um, how do we um, link our two kind of far-sighted plans? And it, it, uh, this is one of those times where the Port Authority's uh, Port Master Plan and the City of New York's Freight NYC are both um, you know, built together um, with similar goals of um, promoting um, a change really in the way supply chain takes place uh, in uh, the New York City region. And that's uh, a region of you know, 20 million people um, that spans uh, three states uh, and uh, uh, is, um, has the buying power equivalent to uh, Australia, the, our gross uh, regional product is similar to uh, is about $1.7 trillion. So, uh, and I've been in New York City my whole life for over 50 years. And uh, I always hear about New York City is, is dying or is about to die and all of this. And uh, honestly, I think it's all hogwash. So, uh, you know, and I think that the statistics, the trade statistics that Sam uh, shared there, bears that out. Um, but, um, but things are changing uh, when it comes to the region's supply chain. Uh, chain. Um, and you know, we, uh, we are looking at maritime as one of the solutions. I'll go into that in greater detail. Uh, we're also looking at the environment and uh, how do we uh, decarbonize uh, our, it, um, our supply chain systems. And, and also how do we just reduce friction in the supply chain system we have a very old um, network in the New York uh, City region. Uh, most of it was built um, beginning in the, uh, after World War II um, uh, through the 1960s and 70s, but a lot of it has stayed the same and uh, needs to be looked at. And both of our Port Master Plan and Freight NYC address that. Um, uh, the, uh, the other thing that uh, is important to EDC is we are very much keyed in on uh, investment in, uh, in infrastructure, as well as, uh, you know, good quality jobs that uh, come out of um, those investments. Uh, and we see growth in the supply chain industry as, you know, as so, such a great need that uh, we're even working with uh, local public schools to promote jobs um, and also with the local colleges uh, as well. SUNY Maritime and uh, Kings Point. Um, so uh, Sam made a very good point about e-commerce. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and also to say that, you know, one of the things we saw in COVID was the switch from the uh, sort of just in time as being the mantra to uh, just in case logistics. And, um, you know, it was very fraught times uh, beginning in February uh, um, but, you know, certainly March and April were very literally scary times for us. Um, and there was a lot going on, you know, um, we looked at, you know, maritime solutions, both in, um, you know, doing a rapid dredging of the Manhattan cruise terminal to make way for the Navy ship Comfort. Um, we also, um, were very much concerned about, um, uh, our truck dependency, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but you know there was a period in which out-of-state uh, truckers for domestic uh, consumption primarily, and primarily food and uh, medical supplies, were concerned about driving into New York City. So uh, one of the responses uh, that we took was to um, uh, make an option for truck drivers uh, coming from out-of-state uh, to drop their loads off outside of the city limits um, so that local New York City uh, truck drivers could pick up um, and bring them uh, to the distribution centers within the city. And um, I dwell on that point because uh, one of the things we learned was there, there were a few maritime companies. We had a maritime option and, um, uh, and some maritime companies uh, showed interest. And that was something uh, that was notable for us because um, we have been looking at uh, European and Asian models for quite some time to help solve you know, chronic uh, uh, congestion 
in and around New York City. And um, just to talk about the, these drivers a little bit, um, you know, consumer demand um, um, is picking up. Um, so, uh, as I said before, you know, the, uh, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the concern that New York was in the demise is, uh, is, is certainly not borne out by um, uh, some of the facts on the ground. And certainly um, the, uh, this demand, the surging demand in e-commerce, I and mean, if you look at these numbers, 44% increase in uh, e-commerce sales really then um, is also showing up in the demand for, for the first time since I've been doing this job in uh, major you know, international companies, uh, some of them, you can guess who their names are, um, buying properties all uh, within New York City um, and um, really not concerned about the traditional sort of price point of New York City uh, land values, but um, all because you know of this uh, surging uh, demand in commerce, people wanting their goods same day or next day, and uh, really, as as we've learned how to use, you know, Zoom and WebEx uh, and uh, Teams and all of these new uh, gadgets, uh, people are certainly also uh, getting uh, stronger in uh, clicking um, on their buttons to uh, to buy things uh, for home delivery. So. Uh, so this is a notable shift uh, uh, that New York City is seeing. But at the same time, you know, it's heightening the fact that we have this uh, mid 20th century uh, infrastructure. Um, and, uh, and this is by, by no means, we, we are very pleased with the performance of the George Washington Bridge Sam. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it is, uh, it's still as beautiful as it was when it opened, um, uh, but it's really the workhorse uh, because about uh, about 75% of the goods coming into New York City uh, use that bridge, about 30,000 trucks per day. Um, so it, it really heightens the fact that the other gateway into New York City, which is uh, through what we call the Southern Gateway, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, um, leads into uh, the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, which was built um, just about uh, World War II and uh, is, uh, as you can sort of make out, is uh, in need of major repair, which uh, focuses more attention on the George Washington Bridge. Um, and so um, our, you know, our concern at EDC is uh, how does this all work? Um, how, do we, how do we start to um, uh, break the dependency on trucking, which represents about 90% of all of the freight trips in the city? And start to use uh, other infrastructure, and I think for this um, for this uh, group, um, the answer, you know, it very much lies in maritime and um, in ways that are both local as well as regional, um, and very much look at um, what takes place in Europe and Asia, where uh, there is uh, sort of, you know, the uh, local point-to-point -point, uh, barging, uh, short sea shipping activities that uh, can take place. Um, you know, within a, uh, a, um, a local region. Um, and um, for us, that really means, for the most part, finding landing locations uh, in New Jersey where, um, where freight, uh, where distribution centers exist and, and having barges um, provide kind of the second to last mile trip into the city. And uh, that, uh, you know, is uh, something that, um, uh, we are getting ready at EDC by issuing a request for expressions of interest uh, that will be due out um, very soon um, for um, the other side of the coin, which is more docking locations within New York City itself, including Manhattan, which uh, you know has uh, very few options, does not have railroad access, uh, doesn't really like to have heavy trucks. Um, so providing um, these uh, you know, landing locations, we believe, will create um, a lot more um, opportunity uh, to start to uh, reduce uh, pressure on uh, the regional highway system. Um, but um, stepping back a little bit to the wider region, um, I wanted to draw everyone's attention uh, about um, a year and a half ago, uh, the Port Authority and uh, EDC uh, stood up an organization uh, with our partners up and down the Northeast Coast uh, from Maine to Virginia, an organization called the North uh, Atlantic Marine Highway Alliance. And 
that's looking at the broader goal um, because what I'm talking about affects not only New York City, but really up and down what we call the Interstate 95 corridor. Uh, again, the uh, uh, in many ways, the lack of, um, uh, 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 of highway capacity for all of the consumer demand that exists in this highly congested corridor. So uh, a, a lot of interest um, has been expressed um, from uh, these uh, partner uh, port cities um, to be able to create um, more open ocean uh, marine highway type systems uh, using um, using uh, probably uh, tugging barges uh, for both containerized international containers, as well as for roll on, roll off um, truck trailers. Uh, and what we see is uh, a real interest really to start with domestic cargo and then move to, uh, uh, and then look at the uh, international cargo. Um, we have, uh, you know, an opportunity um, Therefore, investment in these systems, and um, I can't stress enough for our international uh, listeners, like how um, how how much uh, we are looking towards uh, the European models, talking with um, you know with countries that are doing this at scale. But um, we need to learn, and we need investment in vessels, terminals, um, in updated cargo tracking systems that um, that the maritime industry uh, locally hasn't really used um, uh, to great effect um, for higher value commodities. So, uh, so a lot of opportunities um, uh, for uh, the Capital Link um, uh, participants today uh, in uh, changing uh, the way goods move uh, in and out of the region. And uh, with that, I'm going to stop my talk and um, Sam and I are open for questions. Yeah, uh, no questions so far. Oh, wow. It's a, it's a shame. You guys have been very good in terms of uh, laying out what you have been doing. One question I'd like to ask you is, as a closing statement, can you elaborate a little bit what's next? In terms of your, I mean, of the agenda that you both have. And also uh, another thing to ask you, do the two of you coordinate, work together? I mean, each one has a different uh, area of uh, focus, but at the end of the day, uh... we 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 have a standing meeting every month. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, it's uh, we also, um, you know, for instance, we have this uh, North Atlantic Marine Highway Group that meets every quarter, and that's with all of those port cities uh, that we've discussed. Uh, we have a Metropolitan Rail Freight Council that just met today with all of the regional railroads. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of coordination um, and we have great fun negotiating leases and permits, right, Sam? Yeah, yeah. Nick, uh, yeah, uh, well said, Andrew. And Nick, to your, your question about what, what next, um, you know, it really goes back to this, uh, my, my earlier comment and also what you heard from Rick Cotton, you know, just about the port department's business and how we've been re resilient uh, th through this. I guess what I would tell you is, is, is that, you know, um, not unexpectedly, uh, the shipping industry is, uh, continues to, to invest. And what they're telling us is that, um, you know, the big, big ships that are already here are going to remain and they're going to get a little bit bigger. Uh, so we're already starting to look at the next uh, next round of infrastructure investments in, in, in the waterway uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, we definitely need to go deeper. Uh, we need to have more anchorages. So that work needs to is starting now. Uh, we don't need to wait on that. I guess the other thing that I would say is that just, you know, it, 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 when you have a crisis in I guess all crises are, are different to some extent, um, but that your, your, your overall business trajectory remains somewhat strong. I, I would just say it, it's, um, it's a signal to the terminal operators and their investors 
and to the shipment companies them, them, themselves that you know we, we, we need to continue to invest to create capacity and the necessary uh, in infrastructure. Now I'll, I'll just say just in terms of the business of uh, the port division, leasing activity, people wanting to invest, people wanting land, we've never been busier. Well, I had heard uh, from one of the law firms that we work with that there has been a lot of interest coming from private equity funds in terms of investing into uh, uh, port infrastructure. Is that, is that the case? I think it's true. I mean, when I started, um, a lot of the stevedoring companies and terminal operators were mo almost mom and pop shops. And now you have big uh, investment. Uh, you know, the I think for us, the big shock was the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan uh, taking over two terminals in New York Harbor. And that's uh, that's now going on uh, about eight years, right, Sam? But um, but still, the amount of attention from big capital is uh, is still very strong. Yeah, private equity, infrastructure funds, and pension funds. Uh, Nick, we do have two questions that that came in. Yes. One, maybe have Andrew. Uh, yeah, the first one, uh, uh, Joseph. Thank you for your question. And the answer is yes. Uh, we had we did an analysis. Um, about a year and a half. I don't see what the question is, uh, Andrew. Oh, the question. Oh, I'm sorry, right? People can't see it. So, does the cost of a liner barge service from Mid Atlantic to New York, New Jersey, make sense according to your projections? Does this already exist? And uh, the answer is, you know, uh, uh, the projections that we've seen, it does make sense, uh, particularly for you know, heavy overweight cargo, um, you know, that uh, normally would sort of break the 80,000 pound weight limits um, on the highways. Um, and um, basically, you know, there are some, some of the markets like, for instance, Long Island, uh, Eastern Long Island makes a lot of sense. And that was driven mostly by the cost of congestion um, and also the cost of fuel before the, the COVID uh, pandemic. So, uh, you know, we are facing the fact that uh, fuel costs are lower um, and uh, there's less congestion, but we expect that, uh, it, you know, that will change. Yeah, I would, I would just make an observation that, you know, uh, at least in terms of, you know, there, there, there can be domestic cargo that could move by, by, by barge and some of that already exists today. In, in terms of the container on, on, on barge, it, it, there, there probably are are commodities that it plays itself to. I, I think the the heavy over width, over height plays in. It has struggled to really take hold in, in the United States uh, for a variety of factors. Uh, uh, labor uh, can be uh, labor on both ends of the the container move is could be could be one 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 factor. But it's clearly not the only factor. Uh, it tends to not be able to compete as well with, with, with truck, just based on uh, uh, distance and then also just frequency of service. Where the water miles are actually shorter than the truck mile, uh, and we've seen examples of that in the mid-Atlantic and also in the Gulf, it, it, it has more, uh, it has, it has more uh, appeal and readiness to be, to be, to be used. Um, so, uh, a question from Ken Hoxter is that thinking about the future, what percentage of freight is moved by rail versus truck? Do you have any autonomous testing in region or too congested to run additional truck tests on port? Any additional automated investments uh, planned? So the first part of that question is in, in terms of our total container uh, move, um, during COVID, uh, actually, our, our intermodal uh, cargo as a percentage, intermodal rail as a percentage of our total has actually increased. Uh, we've been hovering around 15 to 16% of our total container volume has been uh, rail. It has been uh, growing, but then so has total, total container volume just because of the, such a large local and regional market that's served by, um, by truck. Uh, we're getting closer to the, the 19, 20% uh, at, 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 at the moment. And, uh, I'll just just say that uh, our intermodal rail volume also set a, uh, a monthly record uh, in, in in August. So we we see we see that pretty 
you know, continuing in, in the near term. Uh, in terms of, you know, technology, autonomous testing, I mean, I think we are at the front end of this, of this technology. We're going to see uh, more of it. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the issue of automation in general is, is, is something that's very topical in, in the U.S. port in, industry. You know, there, there are, uh, you know, uh, some of it is a la labor negotiation with the terminal uh, uh, operators, but, uh, you know, we are definitely moving in that uh, direction. One thing that the, 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 the terminals are gravitating to, not all the terminals, and that is, um, you know, appointments uh, within a two-hour window for, uh, you know, truck, to, you know, pickup. And we, we see that as a kind of a capacity management uh, uh, issue as well. I just to answer the question from New York City's perspective, um, our truck share is about 90%, our rail share is about 2%, and, the, uh, and maritime is about 8% uh, by, by volume. And uh, that's something where we'd like to move the needle. Uh, not, you know, we'd certainly like to see if we could get um, maritime up over 10% uh, in terms of volume, that would be a win. Uh, get rail up a couple of percentage points. We would feel it, I think, uh, on the highways, take some pressure off the bridges and the roads. Um, on autonomous testing, I really want to say we're excited about the potential. Um, in New York and also looking, we are looking at some historic like freight corridors uh, and seeing whether you can do a closed loop um, demonstration in, uh, in some of these uh, uh, areas um, that could connect to uh, in our city distribution centers that, that where automation, if it's applied and it brings down the unit costs, um, we think would be transformative, um, especially with green uh, fuel technologies too. I think Nick, you're on mute. Uh, and so before we adjourn, I have seen in, in both of your presentations and also uh, Rick Cotton's that the international element plays a much bigger role in the overall traffic. Yes. So, and exactly, we're delighted to have you with us because you know we are dealing primarily with the international maritime community. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to promote New York as a global maritime hub uh, and make them uh, come to New York and do more business here. Anyway, so uh, I think we are very close to uh, our time. I would like to thank you both uh, for, uh, oh, we have two minutes left. Uh, so uh, any particular closing statements? I'll go first, Nicholas, just to thank you again. And we, uh, you know, we are a global city. So uh, what you're doing is important to us. Um, we can, we would love to follow up with uh, participants in your conference on, on ideas for uh, making our supply chain a little bit more uh, Europeanized or, uh, uh, you know, and a little bit more modernized. Uh, so if people want to reach out, um, we have the R that request for expressions of interest coming up um, in, uh, in a week or two. Uh, they could go to nycedc.com, um, but also uh, reach out directly as well. Thank you. And Sam, a closing statement from you. Yeah, Nick, I'll just keep it real, real quick. And this is this is really a nod to the, your 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 uh, your conference attendees. You know, uh, this has been a difficult period with 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 COVID. I mean, we're also dealing with you know keeping our families and friends and parents safe. Uh, but I got to say, there's no industry that I'd rather be in right now than the maritime industry. This is an industry that works together, sticks together is bold and future oriented. And I think, you know, collectively we, uh, despite the, the issues, the headwinds, we collectively have a lot to be proud of. And we should thank be. You. Thank you very much. I reciprocate the comment. And again, thank you very much for being with us. And we have our eye to the next year, but hopefully we'll do things together in the meantime. Okay, thank you. All the best. Thank you. Yeah, stay well. Thank you. Bye.